So I mentioned this already, so let me just quickly take you through this. Um, the requirement here is that pilot input should be pulled at rates greater than 16 milliseconds, which means that no more than one input per 16 milliseconds, which means that when an input comes, it should be written out before 16 milliseconds. The other one is uh, the state of the flight dynamics being updated every 12.5 milliseconds. I, I mentioned this already when we discussed this. The third one is the end to end constraint. I think I said 150 and 200 is 150 and 100, 100 for fighter aircrafts. By the way, fighter aircrafts are by design unstable, more unstable than commercial aircrafts. So, which means that they are dependent on the, on the computer working much more critically than for commercial aircraft. Commercial aircraft, the pilot can take over at short notice. In pilot aircrafts, in uh, com um, fighter aircrafts, if the computer dies, the plane is gone, which is why these are much more critical for fighter aircrafts. Okay? Let me give you the uh, picture here. So, this is the profile of the reactor. If you do not have the power supply to the coil, temperature starts to fall at this rate. So, which means that if the lowest temperature you want the system to reach is T flow, at which point flow can stop, you want to catch that before that happens, that temperature is reached. So, you have this much amount of time to deal with the falling temperature, which means that once you detect that T min has been reached, you want to turn on the heater again within this amount of time. So, knowing the slope is important. This is where the physical characteristics of the environment come in. Similarly, when, you're, when you turn the heater on, system will take a certain amount of time to get up to maximum speed, maximum uh, temperature, at which point you want to catch it and not when the temperature reaches T boil. So, this again, this amount of time is how much you have to react to it. Okay. This I mentioned already. So, you can convert all of this into a set of concurrent tasks which do the actual control and they have sensor input like form empty, the point B being reached, A being reached and then output to the actuators on forward, on backward of, of things like that. Same thing here also, you measure the temperature, get it into a variable, look at the thresholds being reached, if so do something, otherwise nothing else. Okay? It is a very simple, but uh, good example of how control tasks are usually programmed. Okay, I have been talking about sh scheduling and operating systems, so that is where we will go next. So, the goal of the real time system, which is the core that we are talking about, is to make sure that events are reacted to to perform predefined actions within specified time intervals. The key is specified time intervals, right? And which we use the word feasibility checking or it is also called schedulability analysis. Is something schedulable? Is something feasible or doable in a way that all the time constraints will be met? And uh, there are lots of different ways of doing this. I am sure some of you have seen some of this before, but probably not in this combination. Um, and these relate to the various characteristics that we started talking about of real time system. Is it dynamic? Is the laxity large? Is it uh, safety critical versus firm versus soft? So, depending on the answers to these questions, we will have to choose between these paradigms. Paradigms meaning classes of scheduling algorithms. And um, the key differences are when do you do the scheduling feasibility checking? When do, you sh when do you check whether it is possible to do something? Do you do it statically, meaning at design time or when the system is running? The second is what is the result of the analysis? Is the result itself a schedule or is it simply an answer yes or no? It can be one or the other. So, that gives us four combinations. So, 
The first is what I would call as a table driven approach. It is static table driven in the sense that the table is created statically and kept around until the end of the system. This is being done at design time. So a good example of this is a railway timetable, a flight timetable which is set for a period of time. Not when an aircraft is ready for departure but every three months the airline company says we are going to have these schedule is published. Everybody can know what it was happening. Any perturbations on this is being done within the confines of this static table. Right. So this is called static table driven approach. You perform the static schedulability analysis by checking if a schedule is derivable. Can, can you derive a timetable? And the resulting table tells you when the system will allow tasks to start. Like start time for a flight, end time for a flight, all of that is pre-specified. <coughs> tasks are periodic or are transformed into periodic as periodic tasks, for example. Very predictable. If Jet Airways says it's going to leave at 6.40 in the morning, chances are it will leave at 6.40. Right? You can depend on it. Highly inflexible. If there is a thunderstorm, if there is a rain, if there is a strike, a sudden strike called by employees, things go for a toss. People start to pile up in the, air, in the airports. So any change to tasks and the characteristics may require a complete overhaul of the table. Especially in railway timetable, we see this happening, right? If one train is delayed, there will be a, a cascading effect on other trains because the resources are being used one after the other. Okay? The, so that is an example of something being done statically and the result itself is a schedule. The second is an example of things being done statically, but the result is not a schedule per se. The result is a priority assignment according to which if the system runs at run time, the predictability achieved at design time can be preserved. And this is called the rate monotonic approach, a very simple idea, lower the period, higher the priority. If you do something very frequently, give it a high priority. If you do something less frequently, give it a low priority. And the nice thing also is that the analysis is very simple. You look at the task utilization, where utilization is computation time over period. The semantics of this is that um, semantics of this is how much of the processor is required per unit time for this task. I am going to run this task for a computation time every period. So computation time divided by period will give me the amount of time per unit CPU time I need this processor for this task. Is that clear? So the utilization of the processor for this task is given by this. If the sum total of all of that is given by natural log of 2 is less than natural log of 2 which is about 0.69 then I know that it is feasible. Actually the natural log of 2 comes from this formula which is the actual formula. It is called the Liouville and Leyland bound. Ci over Ti is the, is the utilization for task i. Sum total of all of that should be less than n which is the number of tasks times 2 raised to 1 over n minus 1. For very large n this boils down to 0.69. Okay. So the test is very simple and it gives you a priority assignment followed by a yes or no answer. So tasks at runtime are executed highest priority first with preemptive resume policy which means that any time you are always running the highest priority task. If while I am running this a higher priority task comes I stop this by preempting it, run this and it is over I come back and resume it and go on. That is the mantra. So to do this, we have to know the execution time or the computation time for every task. Like I mentioned before, predictability does, doesn't come for free. You should be able to analyze your task to be able to get this number. If you have resources, things get a slightly more complicated. Um, you have to know how much the worst case blocking time is. What's the blocking time? You're using something. I need it. I have high priority. I can't get to it because you locked it now. I'm blocked for the duration can be analyzed, then in that case I had to put the blocking time into the formula and apply. Okay, what is the story behind this? Uh, very fascinating. 
you all know about the Apollo mission right, the Apollo missions which went to the moon. So, 1969 or thereabouts uh, Professor Liu who was then at Illinois, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, was a young assistant professor. He wanted to do something for the summer practically. So, he went to JPL, Jet Propulsion Labs in Pasadena, California. He talked to a lot of engineers saying what do you do, what do you do, what do you do and one common theme that he heard from them was we assign priorities according to smallest period implies highest priority. More frequent something is the more higher priority it is and it sort of seemed natural to do it, but it is not clear whether that is the right thing to do. So, he is a theoretician, he was and still is and um, he said I am going to analyze this from first principle and then said that if tasks are periodic and deadlines are equal to the period, the example assumption we have been making and tasks are released at the beginning meaning that they come into the picture to be executed at the beginning, they do not suspend themselves meaning that voluntarily they would not give up the CPU, they have bounded execution time, they are independent meaning no resources are required, this is his analysis at that time and the overheads are negligible meaning the preemption resume costs are 0. Then he proved that the rate monotonic assignment, why is it called rate monotonic? Higher the rate higher the priority right. If according to this assignment and if you run highest priority first at run time, then if this formula holds things are feasible. Now, this is what kind of uh, formula necessary or sufficient? It is a sufficient formula which means that if this condition holds you can be sure that these tasks will meet their deadlines and run according to the periodicity requirement. It is not necessary which means that even if this is not holding it is quite possible to have task sets which are doable which will meet the periodicity requirement. So, naturally there are two questions that arise under what conditions is a task set feasible and what or rather is there a feasible and check or schedulability check which is both necessary and sufficient and the answer that is to that is there is no check unless you put some constraints, no check which is feasible which is sufficient and necessary. The, check, the conditions are as follows, if all the periods are harmonics of each other, what does it mean? There is some base period, all of this are multiples of that period, then this right hand side bound is 1, this can be replaced by 1, which means what? The CPU can be kept 100 percent busy and yet meet all the periods, whereas the earlier formula which applies to any arbitrary period and arbitrary computation time the sufficient condition says this bound should be 0 0.69 which means that the processor cannot be loaded more than 69 percent. So, this one condition the condition corresponding to 1 says if the periods are harmonic then we can use all of the processing power ok that is one of the ways in which this can be improved. So, I started talking earlier about um, how do you design these deadlines and periods. If you come across a task set given to you to be run on a, on a given processor, you size the tasks come up with the computation times, you apply the formula and you find that it is not feasible. One option for you is to go back to the designers and ask the question, can we make these periods harmonic? So, if there are 3 tasks let us say computation uh, period of 11, 16 and 6, I can convert this to 10, this to 15 and this to 5 and get harmonic periods. The, so, that is a big plus I can now see if the computation times over these periods respectively will lead to anything less than 1. What is the downside? Earlier I was dividing the computation time by 11 to understand to get the utilization of this, now I am dividing by 10. So, utilization of this has gone up same thing for the others also. So, required utilization goes up, but the bound becomes 1. So, there is a give and take. 
the bottom line is you can go back to the control engineers and ask the question can I change the periods in such a way that they are harmonic and most often the answer is yes unless the device is constrained to be sample only at once every 16 seconds or whatever okay. So, that is one option as, as, a, as people who, who might be called upon to design systems here is one option in case the, the bound the Leo and Leland bound does not hold. The other more complicated way is to do something called exact analysis. I would not have time for this I am going to just introduce you to the idea behind the analysis. Exact analysis uh, I am going to illustrate through this example we have 4 tasks periods 3, 6, 5, 10. If you do the test add up the utilizations it comes to 0 0.9 the bound for 4 n equals 4 is 0 0.75. So, the, the condition does not hold as it turns out this is not true this does not imply that it is not schedulable. Why? Because of the reason I gave you before this is a sufficient test not a necessary test you would like something which is both. One possibility is to change the periods the other is to take this itself and do this analysis on a instance by instance basis. Now, think about it in the following way what is the worst case response time inducing condition and what conditions will a particular periodic task experience the worst case response time. Task arrives here how long will it take to finish? The execution time for sure it needs to execute its own computation what else can happen? During its execution a higher priority task might come. So, the ex this execution time will expand by this much. Now, this is a new assumed response time. Earlier we assumed the response time to be equal to the computation time alone. Now, we expanded it because more interrupts might arrive with a higher priority. With this new expanded response time you check again whether more interrupts will come at that within this interval. If they do this will expand some more. See why is expansion is happening? Because you are assuming an execution time or response time and then within the response time asking the question will, will any higher priority interrupt come. So, as a period as you keep on asking this question again and again and again finally, a point will come where the response time does not expand any anymore that is the final response time. So, this is the basic idea behind exact analysis you start with the task having the highest priority check its response time what will be its response time? it is computation time nothing else you can know the higher priority task exists. Next task is computation time plus any other arrival of a higher priority if the response time is less than the period you are done. Next task this is called a recurrence relation and the rec recurrence relation goes as follows for any task in the n plus 1 iteration of this expansion its own computation time should be added to the response time derived in the last iteration of the recurrence relationship. How many higher priority tasks will come? The response time divided by the period of the higher priority task and what will be the total required computation time that many instances of arrival time the computation time. So, whatever I told you by hand is here in formulaic terms as it turns out if every response time if every task response time is less than the period then the task set is said to be feasible. This check is both sufficient and necessary. The only complication here is that it takes some amount of iterations to go through it, but you can write a very simple program to do this and this is called the exact analysis. Is this clear? So, what I would like you to do is again when you go back to your rooms or on your way back home go through these numbers. I suggest not looking at the slides before you do the numbers you have the basic idea the intuition behind it apply it for this task set this this four, four, four task set and make sure you understand it. only if you have any difficulty go back to this slides and see where you have gone wrong ok. Is that clear? Now, so we looked at two parts of the four paradigms static table driven static priority driven. By the way the term static is used in the static priority driven in a very special way. In static table driven the static is the time at which the table is created design time statically. In static priority driven 
this has two connotations either you derive the priorities at design time or statically or more precisely the term static qualifies priority. All the priorities given to the tasks are static in nature they do not change. So, if you take two instances of two tasks let us say I have a task with period 3 two instances of a task and it is and a task with priority with period 5 this is 3 here assume these intervals are of equal length these two instances will have the same relationship with this instance. So, for example, this is running it finishes work it has a higher priority then this instance starts running when this is running if this next instance comes this will be preempted. Why because all instances of this task are higher priority than all instances of this task. So, static priority means that independent of when you look at an instance its priority will always be higher than any other lower period lower priority task instance that is the property of rate monotonic that is why it is called static priority. Now, there is another way of assigning priorities called earliest deadline first something that we all use on a daily basis right. We have two things to do we do the one which has an earlier deadline first. Earliest deadline first is a dynamic priority algorithm why for example, let me take uh, specific numbers here at this time both these tasks are ready to execute this has a deadline of 3 this has a deadline of 5 which has earlier deadline the top one. So, it is executed ok and done and gone this is the only task waiting to be done it is taken up for execution is is executing and at this time this task comes in. In the rate monotonic case what happened this took over the processor in the earliest deadline first case this has a deadline of 6 this has a deadline of 5. So, this wins what happened is that a lower period task instance has a priority which is lower than a higher period task let me repeat that this instance of the ta of this task this instance that is of this task has a lower priority compared to this instance of the higher period task not thinkable in the context of rate monotonic, but possible and happens in the case of earliest deadline first why because this instance has a period of 5 that is a the, um, deadline of 5 this has a deadline of 6 5 wins over 6. So, that this continues to run even after the arrival of this is that clear. So, this is dynamic priority <coughs> two instances have to be related by the deadlines and not by the periods this is clear. So, earliest deadline first also is um, ha, can be analyzed in the same way in that case this bound becomes 1 whereas the bound was 1 for this only for the case of the harmonic periods is 1 for the case of EDF for all periods. The only reason EDF is not used in practice as much as it should be given this increased bound is because of this dynamic priority changes why because every time there are two instances to be run of different periodic activities you have to look at the dynamic you have to dynamically look at the deadlines and make the decision as to which to execute next. Another reason is uh, that typically in a processor you have priority levels assigned to devices interrupting that processor typically the 4 lines or 8 lines or 16 lines as the case may be. What you can do is associate a one of those interrupt lines with a device associate the highest priority device line with the highest priority device which means the lowest period device. So, it is a direct mapping between what the rate monotonic priority assignment is and the priority lines on the processor the hardware and the processor will ensure that at any time if there is an interrupt line which is enabled it will run that interrupt routine corresponding to the highest priority interrupt. So, the hardware support for highest priority first execution ok. So, all for all of those reasons rate monotonic is the assigned uh, is the uh, preferred priority assignment policy and uh, even though in, in 
the literature, there's a lot of work on ADF-based approaches, and some systems also built around it. Is this clear? Okay. So both of these were, at least the way I described it, statically done. The assignment of priorities in the case of the second approach and the creation of the table. There is really no reason why it can't be done dynamically. In fact, we do this all the time. We start in the morning. We have a certain plan for the day. When we're here at this time, here at this time, here at this time. And around the static schedule, we create a dynamic schedule. Somebody calls, we pick up the phone. If we can, if we have the time to do it. If somebody calls when we are doing something which is statically scheduled, we don't pick up the phone. So we are doing dynamic allocation of work on top of statically allocated work. Right? And this dynamic allocation might result in some movement of the statically allocated tasks. So if I decided to finish this class by 1 o'clock, which I had, I am dynamically changing it to 1.15 now. The work will get done. Nothing else will happen because there is no consequence to this delay other than delaying lunch by 15 minutes. So we have static allocation on top of which we make dynamic allocation or dynamic scheduling changes, which is a norm. Same thing applies in real time systems also. So here what we do is to do feasibility checking at runtime. A dynamically arriving task is accepted only if it is feasible to meet its deadline. And we say that this task is guaranteed to meet its time constraints. As in the case of um, the first two approaches, the result could be a priority assignment or a schedule itself. So in a sense, we have the best of both worlds, flexibility of dynamic approaches with some predictability of static approaches. That happens only if you check the feasibility before taking it on. Okay? This feasibility check being done dynamically has a very important consequence. What is the consequence? We may have to say sorry. Correct? We may have a new task arrival which happens to come at a time with a certain requirement in terms of deadline which cannot be accommodated. So you should have the flexibility to say sorry. And the application should also be designed in such a way as to accept the answer of sorry. Right? And um, this requires some amount of uh, complexity to be, to be added to the system. Because now you have to ask the question, I want to do this work with the deadline. Up, send it to the scheduler. Scheduler comes back and says, no, retry it. Retry it with a different set of characteristics. You know, I had initially said I want to finish it by 5 o'clock, now I can make it 6. I can initially, I can perhaps run something of a shorter duration with the same old deadline than something that I had planned to do before. There are many activities like this, right? So for example, scheduling itself is one such activity. The general scheduling problem is NP hard, meaning that computationally is very intensive. Now, what we have here is a very interesting situation. I have a timeline going in that direction. I have a task arrival here. Let me call it A. I have a task deadline here. And I have to do two things within this interval. What are they? Execute the task given the computation time and also plan the task execution, which will itself will take some time. The conundrum here is the following. The more time I spend on planning, the better the plan I get, right? We all seen this, right? If you look at all the options and look at which option is working best, it'll take you a long time. But the longer you take for for planning, the less time I have for the actual execution. The shorter time you take for planning, the more you have, but the worse the quality of the planning itself is. So that is one issue. So in a practical system, you have to deal with this. The other issue is. When do I do the planning? If I do the planning as soon as the task arrives, I get the benefit of having other options in case the system says sorry. But the sooner I have to do this, the state in which the task will execute is likely to change from that point to the point where the task executes according to the schedule. Because, for example, suppose I'm measuring the um, the altitude of, of a flight to make a decision. Between when the planning task executes and when the task itself executes, there might be a difference in time. There will be a difference in time. And if the computation time of the task depends on the altitude of the flight, I have to look at the worst case altitude to come up with the planning parameters. Follow me? I have to know how long the task will take to execute, when it's scheduled, 
and that requires some information about the execution time. Assumptions underlying the execution will have to be pessimistic or conservative and the sooner I do this planning the more conservative I have to be because the distance between the planning time and the execution time will be that much larger. Okay? So because of these reasons uh, there are a number of decisions to be made. How do you plan? When do you plan? What assumptions do you make under planning? How much time do I allocate to planning and all of that. So that makes dynamic planning that much hard, that, that much more difficult and complex but you can't avoid it. Unless you have the, the simplest of systems dynamic planning is something that, has, that should be accommodated. If you do not want to pay the, pay the price for it you do best effort which is what most of us do which is do the best to meet deadlines no guarantees what do you use for scheduling earliest deadline first or some notion of importance. This is what uh, for example Linux does it puts all the tasks into one queue adjust the priority according to interactions with the user CPU bound or IO bound and so on and tries the best to provide the best response for the average case user not good enough for things with deadlines. Okay? And then there is a combination of these uh, techniques called cyclic scheduling which is often used in practice uh, things are harmonic in nature you fit the periods into one of these harmonic periods and according to some priority rule apply them you can read this on your own time. So basically what I have said is four different types of scheduling approaches two on the surface are static in nature but given the third one which is a dynamic planning the planning could use one of the table driven approaches or priority driven approaches follow me only complication is all of those things that I mentioned when to plan what to plan with what to do if the plan does not succeed. Um, what are the alternatives generally run something with a higher deadline the first deadline does not work or run something with a shorter computation time and so on or if you have a distributed system you send the task to some other node some other processor which is possible today because most real time systems are also distributed clear. So what do we have in a embedded kernel for real time purposes uh, basically things which are not necessary are removed so it is stripped down um, things are made to run faster fast context switch recognizing interrupts quickly um, locking code and data in memory. Now some people argue that disk should be avoided in embedded systems and uh, the reason for that is simple you all know about virtual memory right how does it work when I am running the code I refer to some variable that variable could be in virtual memory in a page inside virtual memory so I have to fetch the page in by doing a page fault. So what is the worst case execution time for, a, for an instruction the actual exec execution time for the instruction plus the fetching time for the operands what is the worst case for fetching time if, the, if it is brought in from virtual memory secondary memory. So if you add up all of these worst case times it will be enormously pessimistic. So one way to have your cake and eat it too is to have virtual memory as a general principle but bring the code and data into memory before you run the task itself and make sure that nobody else will take away this these pages while you are running and that is called locking or pinning of code and data in memory and then there are special sequential files that can accumulate data at a fast rate typically these files are circular buffers which get overwritten over, over a period of time. So the best example of this is the black box recording system in an aircraft which records the last 18 minutes of uh, all interactions all sensor values in an aircraft remember this the first thing you look for when a flight crashes is the black box because it has the most recent state of the aircraft recorded in all its glory every interaction every announcement every sensor value every actuator value is recorded here. So this is not uncommon in other real time systems also so typically what happens is this gets recorded and before it gets full another daemon task copies every tenth or hundredth or some number of entries to another circular buffer 
that becomes a lower granule, coarser circular buffer, and so on down the line. And the last one is written to disk. So over a period of time, you have the most recent information in a fine granule, less, pre less recent information in a coarser granule, and so on. Finally, for uh, recovery purposes and monitoring purposes, we have something in disk which is of a much, much coarser granule. To deal with time constraints, we have a real-time clock, bounded execution time for primitives, real-time queuing disciplines like earliest deadline first, delay, suspend, resume primitives, and of course, priority-driven scheduling mechanism. Now, if you have a real-time operating system, typically you have priority-driven scheduling. If you have something called a real-time executive, you, have, you use typically table-driven mechanism. The reason uh, this is much simpler, if you look at a table, what will it have? It will say, at time t1, do task x1. At time t2, do task x2. So all that the operating system has to do is set an alarm for the next entry in the table. And that alarm goes off, go to the table, check what the task is to be executed, run the task. Nothing more than that. No priorities, no nothing. So the operating system requirement is much, much simpler. So these are called real-time executives as opposed to a priority-driven scheduling algorithm which requires a much more complicated queuing discipline, interrupt arrivals, triggering tasks, and all of that. Um, which is why the cyclic scheduling slide which I had uses a table-driven approach. Basically, the table contains the primitive, the, the task executions within a priority. And then on top of that, you use a simple priority-driven scheduling algorithm is to take Linux or RT Linux, Linux, convert that to RT Linux or some variant thereof. Take something like uh, NT or Windows, convert that to RT, NT. The reason people prefer this is because you know the system. You know the primitives, you know how to use the APIs and so forth. Disadvantages, as I mentioned before, too many inappropriate assumptions, like the queues being FIFO and so on. So what you'll see this afternoon is uh, RT AI, which is essentially a clone of RT Linux. So basically, the addition, let me just focus on these parts here. Look at these boxes around this cloud. We have interrupt control hardware, the normal system, which sends an interrupt to the operating system. The operating system ha manages the interrupts, and then processes are executed at the, at the top. So what usually happens is processes want to do some I.O. They give control to the Linux system. Linux handles the I.O. through the interrupt control mechanism, and the system comes back. Okay. Now, I will tell you about how the priorities are handled. This I say NT thread priority, but it's actually any priority-driven system has the same idea. If you ignore this top box for a moment, this is usually what happens. The priorities are all given by the system. As tasks execute, they go from low to high priority or, or back, depending on whether they are I.O. bound or CPU bound. A task starts as though it's a time-critical I.O. bound task. As it does more and more computation, it comes down to the priority. As it does more I.O., more interactions, it goes up. You all know this, right? This is called degradable priorities. The priorities degrade over time, spent on the CPU, or Upgrade, upgraded when the priority changes because of more interactions. So the basic idea is to give more responsiveness to I.O. bound tasks. In the case of our uh, policies, we are assuming that we only we have control over the priorities, not the system. So this is not usable for us. So to do something, some uh, sort of serviceability to real-time applications, Something called the real-time class has been introduced in most operating systems today, including NT, Solaris, and so on. So the idea is these are non-degradable priorities. The system doesn't come into the picture, right? So you assign a priority at one of these levels. The system won't bother you. And as long as there's a task at, this, at these levels, it will not execute any of these tasks at the bottom. That ensures that real-time tasks have a higher priority than non-real-time tasks. Are you with me on this? Only problem is that these priorities are lower than interrupt priorities. Okay? What does that mean? Suppose there is a real-time task running now. 
and an interrupt happens for a non real time task. The non real time task interrupt will preempt a real time task running now thereby completely avoiding completely uh, ignoring the priority driven scheduling approach that we have assumed so far and that leads to something called priority inversion ok. Real time Linux came in and said that I will handle the interrupt if the interrupt is for a real time task I will run the task myself if it is for a non real time task I will hold it make it into software interrupt and the, real, the Linux runs only when nothing here in the real time task case is to be run. So, it is like the following I have real time task T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, Tn and then another task called T star which is a Linux task. T star will run only if nothing else to be done in this range including interrupt handling for the T star that ensures that all interrupts which come in and are given time are only real time interrupts and not non real time interrupts ok. This basis is sufficient for the afternoon uh, lab class we will pick up on this tomorrow maybe spend half an hour to an hour we will have done your lab exercise by the time and I will just close this with the remaining tire you know slides on operating system tomorrow ok. Sorry to keep you waiting let us disperse for lunch.